Welcome to Talking Live. I'm Dr. Robbie Ludwig, and thank you for joining us for our COVID-19 special, where we are interviewing some of the most talented people who are using their skills to make the world better in every way. And Chris Piazza is an amazing artist. She's been featured in the New York Times and PBS, and she is going to tell us about how she is making a difference with her husband. Chris, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And I have to say, I was really enjoying reading the article that was written about you in the New York Times, which just featured your artwork and you live in a restored carriage house in Brooklyn. This is correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, with your husband. And it's amazing how that is the theme of your artwork, restoring items that maybe people cast away and you make it into beautiful art. Yeah, I, I really am kind of uh, a fan of, of things. I, li I like to save things. I've, ever since I was a kid, I've always liked to save things. I, I see a lot of value in things that other people might just discard. And, and so I've held on to an awful lot of stuff. And I live in a kind of museum in a way because it's filled with all these odd things. This place that I'm in used to make coin counting machines. Wow. That were used at the turn of the century, the last century, to, you know, that was the, the Nickel Empire. The Woolworth building was built yeah. off of the Nickel Empire. And, uh, you know, the subway was a nickel and to go to Coney Island was a nickel. And so change was a big deal and they had to count it and they made it in this place I'm in. So when I came in here, the building had been empty for 30 years and I was working with the crew doing the cleanup demolition. It was an absolute wreck. And I kept saying to them, save that, save that. I'm going to make a piece out of these. these. Oh, I still have the parts, the patents and everything from the old coin counting machines. We are going to have a link to your artwork, which is just so fantastic. You make life-size puppets. You have large artwork, small artwork, and then flat artwork, you call it, right? Flat artwork. Yeah, wall pieces, yeah. Um, oh, my God. I mean, I'm in love with the red shoes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, my, that and the frolic architecture mm. as well. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful Thank work. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go back to the 70s. When you first came to the city, you were, you were a young girl in your teens, 17 years old and on your own. That's right. Yes. Wow. Was that uncomfortable or exciting? Um, it was tough. It was yeah. very difficult. You know, I didn't get to go to college. I came to New York and I grew up in a kind of Appalachia, Pennsylvania. Mm. And it was just, you know, a hard scrabble survival kind of time. If you watch films like, uh, I saw it recently, the, taking, the original taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3, that was New York back then. It was um, really like grimy and down at its heels, and I lived on the Lower East Side. But it, the hard scrabble aspect of it, I really think helped me to become the shapeshifter that I remain to this day, which has put me into this. You know, it's like, oh, people need basketball. This is what we're going to do. <laughs> you know. I just think it was it was a great time for creative people without any kind of money to come to the city to be in I, I always said I was an immigrant that got off the boat from Pittsburgh. <laughs> you so close when you first got here. Just I mean, so interesting. You would that's how you made your living. You yes. at times would find material in dumpsters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I um I could sew. I could always sew. I was, my grandma taught me to sew when I was a little girl. And, and I made my living doing piece sewing. And, um, you know, it didn't pay anything, but it was a job. And so I, it's so funny. Like what I'm doing now is so much like what I did then. And I started off using the same sewing machine that I had back then, which was originally from like the 1930s, 1940s. And it's just everything old is new again. But um, so yeah, 
Yeah, but I used to make uh, clothes for one of what became one of the big stores, uh, Canal uh, Jeans, and I made their first upcycled clothing. And you would turn blue jeans into like cool, funky boho skirts. Skirts. They, we used to yeah. cut the legs open and put a piece of 1940s uh, curtain upholstery fabric in there. And, and you, yeah, we, go ahead. You know, and they were like long, you know, hippie skirts. I also took these wonderful old rayon dresses, which are worth a lot of money now today, but they, they, they would show me down, take me into the basement. There were a bale of these clothes and they'd say, you know, take whatever you want of these and make them up into this pattern. They gave me this pattern and it was this, this little top with this peplum tie, side tie, really would be like super cool if you could find one of these vintage things now. But um, I made home, I got so many of them. It was so funny. Uh, my husband and I were at a party a couple of years ago and I was so, you know, talk about strange, the synchronicity. I'm telling someone about making these things and there's a woman, she's wearing the ones that I made. <laughs> it almost sounds like, I mean, you were creating costumes and masks for Twyla Tharp. I mean, she's unbelievable. She's huge. It, it's, it's striking to me that you didn't go into fashion design because it sounds like you certainly could have taken that direction. I had opportunities to, and, and, I, and I knew people. I did piece sewing for startup designers. I saw from these people that I knew, who I worked with, what you had to do to get anywhere yeah. as a designer. It, it's, it's a hard road. You really have to find a producer. I mean, it's, it's, it's not so easy. I'm just going to make my, uh, my designs. Uh, and I was an artist. I wanted to do my artwork. I, I really didn't want to do fashion. And so, but I was always on the fringes of it. Like for a while, I worked for this fascinating lady on St. Mark's, way down mm -hmm. near Avenue B, was it? And she made clothes for Debbie Harry for Blondie. Oh my and, goodness. Uh, so Debbie Harry used to come in and get the clothes from her. And she was just, she was always this bedraggled gal, but she had these butterfly exotic butterfly eyes and I was her seamstress you know and I was the girl in the back of the shop and Debbie Harry would come in and she was always trying to get you know like these clothes they didn't have any money then they were they were playing it like CBGs and stuff yeah yeah and I was just in the back like no 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 what are we going to make this week you know <laughs> <laughs> but it was, what was she like did you like her did you like Deborah Harry um you know I didn't get to know her it was um she was I was just the shop girl and I have always been that way. I've always been in the background, but I've been in the background of some pretty interesting situations, you know, over the years. Yeah. So, but I've always been the one in the back. I worked for um, Nina Gill, who ran this place called Victoria Falls. And we did uh, restorations and alterations of antique clothes, but gorgeous antique clothes for, you know, some fabulously um, interesting people. And one of them was Joni Mitchell. And uh, I was challenged to have to fix this dress. <laughs> Joni Mitchell chose this gorgeous, you know, uh, I don't know, Edwardian lace dress. But it had a big hole in the front of it. But I could see why she liked it. And so my job was to find a way to kind of upcycle the dress for her. So you are ahead of your time because right now it's all about just restoration and yeah. reusable fashion and, and being good to the economy. Yeah, yeah, in a way, but I, I wasn't alone. I mean, this was, we were doing this stuff. If you were in the East Village and Soho and back then, we were all kind of like, I don't know. I mean, we got all of our furniture off the street. Mm. And everything was just, it was a different universe. I, I sometimes tell young people about that and they're, they're so like, oh, I wish, and I wish for them that they had yeah. this too. really. When I was looking into your website and we're gonna share your website as <laughs> so people can enjoy your art and actually your masks aren't on there, but we will get to that later. You just, you, you mentioned yourself as the ghost of change. <laughs> exactly, the ghost of change. Well, it, this piece that I wanted to make, 
I was telling the guys I was working with in the demo, I said, I'm going to save all that stuff from those coin counting machines and I'm going to make a piece called The Ghost of Change. And I had actually been working on this. He was a little guy inspired by the figure in uh, the steeplechase figure, the funny face in Coney Island. And, um, and then that piece was destroyed in a hurricane. I used to have a place upstate and it was destroyed by Hurricane Irene. And so all of those pieces, but it was this complicated thing about time and changing money. And it was very funny. I, I really love vaudeville, old vaudeville, old silent mm -hmm. film. My work is very inspired by the, you know, Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, W.C. Fields, this kind of uh, burlesque, you know, but burlesque, old world burlesque, vaudeville. Yeah. And, and I actually performed. I used to do performance pieces with people and I performed on, you know, one of the old Yiddish theaters doing avant-garde theater. And it's just been in my heart, this, this wandering back and forth between history and comedy. And the whole what do you think is about that period of time that's so fascinating and inspiring for you? Um, all the voices, all the talent, all the like, truly raw, genuine, original talent. Someone like Buster mm -hmm. Keaton, incredibly original. Like where in God's name did this extraordinary human being come from? This unique like creation, you know, that he's, he started doing, he was acting with the family at the age of like four or something. Mm -hmm. Father used to throw him out of the, into the audience. I mean, that guy was, I don't know, where someone like that comes from. And I think that there are these times that generate extraordinary originality. And I think mm -hmm. the early part of the 20th century did that. And it's a great source of uh, that 19th century through, you know, the 20s, 30s. I mean, Ginger Rogers singing Earway in the anime, you know, we're in the money during the depression, singing it in pig Latin in the gold mm -hmm. digger. 1931 or 30 or whatever is just like it don't get no better than that i mean it's just this this adorable little blonde with her crooked teeth seeing this in this close-up wearing this busby berkeley costume with great big coins when everybody's flat broke in america and this is entertainment there's something about that that's just so invigorating that you can feel it electrify you and it did for I me as a kid I'm just, I'm looking for the ex exact phrase uh, that you talk about, and I think this is the correct quote. It's one of the tragic things about America that we erase ourselves so quickly. If you continue to erase yourself, you're not, no, you're not going to know who you are. Um, what exactly inspired that statement? Well, I think that America has um, certain problems. <laughs> yeah. And one is that it doesn't seem to want to recognize the value of the old. I mm -hmm. think that it's a big crisis we're going on even in this pandemic. That, mm -hmm. that some people have even made the suggestion that elderly people could be sacrificed right. for the sake of our economy. I think mm -hmm. that that says a lot about something wrong, profoundly wrong, with our values. Um, it's not about constantly, a, a healthy culture and a healthy economy even, can't always be about growing and advancing. There has to be a kind of preserving and learning from and gaining from what has come before. The, mm. you know, other cultures like the Japanese have extraordinary reverence for the old. I have a friend mm. in Italy and she was writing to me about going through this pandemic there. And you know, she's Italian, right? And it was like, with the greatest heart, speaking about the loss of their, their old people mm. as being the loss of them as a culture. They are losing themselves in the loss of these people. Now, every person is like a book. They're, they're a universe of stories, of details, I really think that there's a kind of loss, wandering kind of loss that people have of meaning. 
that's right next door. It's like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. Well, you, you, was, you could have always found it. It was right there with you all the time. Yeah. And I really think that old things, old buildings, trees, old ways, old skills, old voices, old ideas even, some of them are terrible. You know, we shouldn't lynch people for crying out loud. They just passed yeah. a law, what, two years ago that lynching is illegal in this? I mean, I couldn't believe it. It just oh. now. Yeah. But, but so many things that are really old have wonderful, you know, just the spectrum of story that it can that fill, especially young people. And I love the idea of old and young. That's the way yeah. nature should be. So that's what I think we need. I don't think we do this. I think we're in a constant rush. Everything so fast, fast, fast. And I think it's to our detriment. I think we're paying for it greatly through this pandemic. I, I actually think I, I do think I do think that this pandemic is helping everybody to slow down. Absolutely, agree. And to do, do I heard this term me search kind of look at themselves and look at what's not working in their lives and what matters. You know, I think our our values kind of got lost in the speed and distraction of our current day world. I want to focus on the masks because they're, in addition to being gorgeous, I want to ask you what, what got you to think about this idea and venturing into this territory? You and your husband, who's a professional photographer, started making masks. And uh, how many have you made so far? We have to have made over 400. We were yeah. counting the other day, and that was a while ago, and we, we got to around 400, so. <laughs> and the most beautiful fabric and vibrant colors, it's, it's really hard to choose. I mean, I keep looking at all the swatches. Our mutual friend sent me the swatches, and really, it's hard. I mean, I think that's the hardest thing about your mask is choosing what material I want, and it's hard to, to pick just one. So maybe I'll have to pick many. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted, you know. It's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're very reasonably priced, but you're donating many of them to healthcare workers. Yeah, well, the way this started was um, I actually have a, an immune system issue. So mm -hmm. I am careful because I tend to get the cold that comes around. And when I heard about this, my ears were open to it. And I started, my husband and I started self-isolating before Cuomo required it. Oh. Um, and I was, you know, I was thinking, uh, better not go in that store. I might get it there, you know? So we mm -hmm. started staying home. And uh, I'm on a, an email group and we're thinking, now what are we going to do? There's, he couldn't get any photography work. The things that I was normally about to do, my work, everything stopped. Um, I'm on an email group that caters to people in the fashion business and costume. And someone mentioned making masks for healthcare workers. Now, this was early mm -hmm. on, about mid-March. And I said to Michael, well, whatever we were planning on doing now, we were going to put some stuff online, you know get my Etsy shops filled up. So mm -hmm. well, for a little while, at least we've got to make some masks. So I dug out fabrics and we started. And uh, I, I was trying to find where, how to hook up with the hospital. And I spoke to a friend of mine who has a, a shop here in Brooklyn. And she had made, a, it's a dress shop, and she had made the dress for a, a doctor who got in touch with her and said, could you possibly make us some masks? I said, listen, let's combine our efforts. Mm. So we filled that order. And then I put out the word, local Facebook group, next door uh, neighbors, there's some kind of, what's it called, next door digest or something. And before you knew it, it was so early on, the hospitals were so desperate. I'm telling you, it was, it was horrific, horrific, mm. that you have doctors I don't want to mention the hospitals because maybe they don't want this out there, but it yeah. was all the major hospitals that we're hearing about that were desperate for cloth masks because they had nothing to work with. So Perfect. we were working within three days. I had four seamstresses 
someone stepped up to offer to help with the coordinating because I would be up at one o'clock in the morning responding to people. It was like making me like, oh my God, I'm going to get sick from this. We had people offering to deliver and we did this for a long time. It slowed down now because um, the hospitals now have, uh, you know, they have real PPE. They don't need so much these claws. But I want to say that, you know, if you, if you talk to people, um, most experts are saying that we're going to need masks going into the winter, that this is not yeah. going to go away. And it's really the perfect time to get a mask that is just supports healthcare workers, supports artists and small business, and also is beautiful to wear. And you also have a special pouch within your mask that yeah. people can switch uh, what an insert so that it stays super protective. Yeah, I, I, what it is. Just an example. Yeah, I mean, I can show you. Yeah, color here where you can see it against my. Okay, um, no, let me see. What it, you you see how it opens up in there? Yeah, okay, at the top, and this is perfect for. Let me just put this on, okay, and then. It's a, this is a, I was making the pleated mask, so different styles, but I thought the pleated mask was good. It made sure that it went below your chin, which you yeah. want, and then you want it about across the bridge of your nose. Right. Now, some folks like the wire, but some folks don't. And in order to expedite getting these things out to people, I thought that just don't put, well, I, at first I put the wire in and then it was like, oh my God, let's just, let's just <laughs> make this so that I can get these done. But right here, if you put, um, just a section of a coffee filter, you cut uh -huh. it, and put it in there, you increase your, um, your protection. Mm. And uh, some people are now saying put a piece of nylon stocking in there, but who has nylon stockings around? So I, I think that the coffee what filter- What about a paper towel? Could you use a paper towel? You could. Some mm -hmm. people okay. use a piece of a HEPA filter. Basically, you know those ones that everybody wears that you get at Home Depot? Those are a synthetic material, mm. okay? They're not terribly breathable, but the, the, the wonderful thing about them is that they're a mesh. The mesh blocks particles. It's gonna block particles much more than cotton yeah. fiber, which is a weave, okay? So if you're gonna go into Trader Joe's, you have your nice weave, which is easier to breathe through, but then you put that, that little bit of cotton fil uh, coffee filter in there, you have your mesh in the middle, and you really have additional protection. If a person who has this is wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask, they're even saying now that you've really increased your protection. Right. Now, it's, this, these are not foolproof, okay? Right. Well, it's still, you know, we want to put out there that, you know, people still need to, at this point, at least if you're living in New York or California or some of the harder hit states, you still need to shelter in, quarantine, and keep your social distance. Right. And don't but, do what I keep doing. Touching your face. <laughs> touch, yeah, right. Touch your face, right? Don't touch your face. And if you have a mask that fits you well, then it helps you really not to touch your face. Now, for people who want to order your masks, where can they go? Well, you can send me an email, okay? okay. Um, that's probably the easiest way. I am going to be putting these on my Etsy shop, which I've got a okay. couple of them. I think I'll do this on the one Fala Loft, F A L L A L O F T. Okay. Good luck if you can remember that one. <laughs> well, I'm going to you send me the details so that we can put it up there. Well, that, the, I'm there I, I want to do these creative masks. I want to do these things with these mid-century silks and some wonderful 1930s novelty fabrics. And they'll have, they'll have ties. So you can put bows on the side. You know, if we have to be wearing these, let's like, you know. I know. I want a Twilight Thorpe uh, mask. I want one of those. And then Dan Whirl around, or what? Or one that you would make for Deborah Harry, inspired by her. I think yeah. that would be amazing. Yeah. Now, for somebody who's ordering a mask, how long will it take from the order until you can fulfill that? Well, order? it depends on. I mean, I try to get them out as soon as I can. Right now, I have okay. orders into next week, and okay. I'm just working all the time on these things. Um, Usually, you know, I will, I communicate with people and, and let them know. Then there's also the mailing time. I have to tell yeah. you, initially I was having a terrible time. I'm in Brooklyn getting things from Brooklyn to 
friends in Manhattan who I was just sending the masks to them for as gifts. My own doctor, I, I sent her a dozen masks and it took two weeks before she got them. So well, I, I'm going to order them. I'm going to order them and I'm going to post a picture of myself wearing them and then you can use that. Okay, wonderful. That would be wonderful. Chris, thank you so much. And please thank your husband for us as well for using your artistic talents in a way that helps healthcare heroes and helps the community at large. We are very grateful to you. We're going to have a link up so people can find you. And I look forward to visiting you when this is all over and buying some fabulous vintage clothes from you. Oh, you know what? It's been, this has been such a pleasure. And I, I, I just want to say before getting off, to all the people out there we were making masks for, we owe you so much more than any words can possibly say. Thank you from all my heart. It, you've, you've, you've given so much to all of us. Thank you. And I will double that sentiment. Thank you so much for joining us on Talking Live, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you. Bye-bye.